So this is my presentation for Econ 5052 Financial Economics. And I'm looking at Agian and Bolton's paper in, of 1997, which looks at a theory of trickle-down growth and development. Uh, trickle-down growth in economics is obviously a hugely important idea. Uh, many would say it's the kind of big dividing idea between left and right in politics um, and their view of how you should grow an economy. Um, should you just let uh, free market economics uh, run free and wealth trickle down to the poor and um, that's in opposition to the idea that perhaps more on the left wing the government should intervene more and that no wealth does not trickle down um, enough or fast enough to help the poor and they mean they need more direct assistance. So a summary of this paper's assertions. Uh, the authors say that wealth inequalities arise and persist because investments generate random returns. Um, so there's an issue here around inequality because of the nature of investments. And using interest rates uh, as modeled by supply and demand, these, these authors say that uh, fast capital accumu accumulation can occur um, and you can get convergence to a fixed schedule where you can eliminate that randomness and you can get an economy growing through trickle-down economics but in their view it's not an efficient way to do it there is a better way to do it which does justify wealth redistribution and the key part of their paper really is that they believe that with permanent redistribution policies you can incentivize the poor to borrow less and you can accelerate the trickle-down of wealth um, through through more efficient and productive growth and the reason that will happen is because through permanent redistribution policies um, the poor will work harder there will be more incentivization of effort and better growth and efficiency um, and I should say the big part of that last point is that essentially uh, in the traditional trickle-down economic model as seen by Agin and Bolton the poor do not put in a high level of a high level of effort when they are forced to share a large part of the returns of that effort with the people that they've borrowed money from. So this is really, I guess, a kind of a stakeholder problem, kind of like the um, the, the CEOs or sort of managers of, an, uh, of a corporation kind of problem. Like how, um, how do you give them a stake in the organization that will incentivize them to work very hard? And essentially, the authors are saying in this paper that poor people are not putting in the effort they would um, if they are forced to share the returns of that effort with the money that they're borrowing um, loans from. So they build a mathematical model. This is basically a mathematical paper where they build an abstract mathematical model and they build a series of propositions uh, based on assumptions and then derive a conclusion from that. The big assumption is that actually um, Lenders and borrowers in this model can actually change, like agents can choose to be lenders or borrowers. They're not fixed as in the traditional model of lenders versus borrowers. Um, in their model, credit rationing actually occurs at low rates of return because rich people don't want to lend to poor people uh, when the rates of return are low. Uh, in their view, in the view of the rich people, it's not worth it there. And so actually that's where poor people face credit rationing is they're not able to get the loans um, and then in the model of uh, choosing whether you're a borrower or a lender, in their model, um, poorer people can actually choose to be lenders uh, when the rates of borrowing are high, because that's how poor people can then actually uh, make a, a good return and get richer. Um, and the authors say that uh, the result of these propositions they build is that you can grow an economy at a faster rate with permanent redistribution policies. Um, that will incentivize poor people. You can essentially accelerate the trickle down process. So it's still an advocation of trickle down economics in one way. It's just saying you can kind of uh, artificially accelerate it and make the conclusion of that trickle down occur a lot faster. It's kind of an end game model, I suppose, as well. In that sense, it's saying that there's like a, um, a sort of end game that the economy is growing to and you can get to that point a lot faster with some sort of permanent redistribution policy. So the assumption of the models are that you've you've got a closed economy, uh, identical agents um, on a continuum. 
of total mass one an agent lives for one period and either works or invests um, and you've got the time period laid out here in this diagram where they make that decision at the beginning to either uh, invest um, and work and then they get the return from that investment and then that third point is like what do you do with the returns from your work or your investment do you consume it or do you leave it to your children and uh, in this model they look at people who inherit different wealth endowments which is another way they differ from traditional models you have revenue from investments you have uh, effort that you put in um, with probability of getting full return on that investments and that probability varies and then you've got a which is the return on the mutual funds um, if you've invested and 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 um, got returns on those mutual funds you then make the decision over how much you're going to lose lose <laughs> or leave same thing maybe to your children which is the warm glow preferences idea um, they use a quadratic function to model the investment returns and that's where the idea comes from essentially that the poor people um, face these high repayment costs in terms of having to share the returns on their investments with the lenders um, there are three classes of lenders uh, poor middle uh, and wealthy and uh, they look at essentially borrowers are rational and they know or have some information on how to maximize their 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 income their revenue and they build this model where they then go on to show that actually wealthy wealthy people uh, may choose not to invest because they can actually maximize their wealth, their wealth without having done that. They don't have to invest in this model um, in order to achieve full returns. Um, on the other hand, the more that you have to borrow, which presumably is because you're poor, again, the less incentive you have to supply effort because more of the marginal returns get shared with the lenders. Um, so this unit repayment, uh, they use Rho, must vary with w the risk of the default so in equilibrium they all get the same expected returns um, and in, in in equilibrium the effort supply is increasing when the um when pw is fixed independent of, uh, of w the lower the borrower's initial wealth then the less effort you're going to put in um, because you've got less probability of success of the project or rather you put less effort in, sorry, um, uh, which actually means that there is less probability of success of the project. So this is essentially saying that in this situation, poor people will put less effort in because of the incentivization. And that's actually gonna lead to an overall um, slower rate of economic growth uh, for everybody in the end. Um, the poor people are gonna catch up at a slower rate and essentially the, the pie overall is gonna be smaller in the end. And you have a visualization of that here where you see that uh, the effort supply is decreasing when the agent has to borrow more. The unit repayment rate, PW, has to be increased to ensure that the lender gets the same expected repayment. So essentially just saying that poor people with less uh, collateral uh, and so on are more risky to lend money to. And so you've got to increase that repayment rate. And that then creates that incentivized problem for poor people. Um, so this is interesting that they actually say credit rationing as a consequence of this model occurs uh, when there are low returns. Um, so what actually happens is that um, there will be agents at low wealth who won't be able to borrow even if they want to borrow, but this actually occurs when the rates of return on lending are low because wealthy people uh, don't see it as worth worth their effort to lend this money or worth the risk. So the result is credit rationing occurring for poorer people. Um, and again, that occurs in, in their model because they say it is a result of people choosing to be borrowers or lenders. Um, and actually, poorer agents can make a rational decision to become uh, lenders and they will do that when, the, when there are high costs of capital, not when there are low costs of capital. Um, they may also, of course, be denied access to credit, as we mentioned, and that creates the incentive problem. So most of the traditional literature will turn that on, it, on its head. Uh, so this is 
challenging that tradition and saying that um, this can occur in their model, according to Agin and Boltian, um, their model can produce this result because the borrowers and lenders are not determined um, outside of the model. So through a series of propositions and assumptions, um, they say that gradually as the economy grows, the, the, uh, the people who are borrowing are gonna get better and better terms, and then they're gonna therefore put more effort into repaying, and the economy is gonna grow faster and faster, and more capital will, will accumulate. Um, but it's gonna be tough in the early stages of the um, economy growing, uh, hence that reference to a Kuznets curve, where in the early stages of growth, um, poorer people are facing tougher terms and uh, wealthy people are facing more favorable lending terms. So they look at a wealth distribution, uh, what they call the limit wealth distribution, that, which they say converges to a unique stationary distribution um, where interventions by the government, for instance, or some other agent can only have temporary effects as you're always moving backwards towards the stationary uh, distribution. What, what you need is uh, essentially um, to bring in a permanent redistribution, which can get through this uh, sort of barrier. Um, you can't eliminate wealth inequalities in the long run, um, despite the fact that wealth is trickling down uh, because you've still got this moral hazard problem of borrowers under investing in effort and getting uh, lower returns because they have to share returns with the lenders. Um, so, um, they look at two distributions, second best and first best, and in the first best one, they're looking at these permanent redistribution policies. Uh, there's an assumption in particular that I picked up on here where they said uh, if the government's budget balance is to be preserved, um, then that's where they're going to come to this policy solution where they can effectively incentivize the rich to lend to the poor at decent rates um, and grow the economy faster. I thought that was a pretty big assumption to make, especially with what's happening right now with COVID. And like much of the model in this paper, um, there are many, many assumptions that you could question that could break the model, I think. Um, but essentially their consequence of their model is that they believe um, you can come up with a policy that can increase the effort uh, and the output of the subsidized borrowers um, by more than it decreases the output and the effort of the tax rich. So you've obviously got this problem where you don't want to disincentivize the rich people by taxing them too much. Um, but they say that one of the ways you get around this is you, you tax them, at, you come up with a proportional tax at the beginning of the, the period wealth. Um, and so in that sense, they've still got the time period rich people to create wealth and leave wealth to their children. Um, and that if you do it in this manner, you equalize opportunities for all, you effectively make uh, lending a sort of equitable environment. You know, all people can get good loans at decent rates, and that's going to create an equality of opportunity that is going to lead to good effort from all economic agents, which is going to grow the economy faster for everybody um, and lead to a much better output for everybody, uh, result for everybody in the end. It's an important paper, I think, in that it is um, well built mathematically in terms of um, propositions and moving from one proposition to another. Um, it's convincing in terms of how they build the math mathematical model and, and the results that lead from that model. It's a good challenge to other theories which don't perhaps take into account the problem with the assertion that um, People start with equal wealth. Of course, we know that people don't start with equal wealth. And so these authors are um, taking that and saying there are things that can follow from that, which turn traditional credit rationing models on their credit rationing models on their head. Um, particularly, it's got this nice key assertion that a, individuals can choose to be borrowers or, or lenders. And they will particularly, for instance, choose to be lenders the more that the rates change. And so even you know, middle class and poor people will lend if the rates are incentivized enough. Um, the critique is, as I've said, it's all built on assumptions really. Um, and in, in a sense, it's like a house of cards, like many mathematical models, they've built assumption and that leads to another assumption, another proposition and so on, and therefore leads to this conclusion. Um, and is it 
reasonable to assume that anybody, for instance, can choose to be a borrower or lender. That's one of the assumptions that is key here. Um, perhaps I fully didn't understand the mathematics of it, but uh, my question was then, you know, if, the, if the poor people are lending, then who are they lending to? I suppose other poor people. Um, they assume free entry into the mutual fund market. Um, they assume agents are risk neutral and parents are leaving um, or do derive utility from leaving wealth to children and so on. Um, they assume that behavior will not change as the model progresses. So they're assuming that people's behavior will ch change, will not change and will, and will be consistent throughout the model as the economy grows and evolves. So for instance, they say in one point, we've assumed that an increase in future subsidies of poor children does not reduce the parents' incentive to accumulate wealth. Now they kind of dealt with that when they said they were gonna bring in a proportional tax on the rich at the beginning of a time period, which would not disincentivize the rich from working hard still to leave wealth to their children at the end of the time period. Um, but again, that's a pretty big assumption um, that on poor children or poor parents, for instance, um, will they be disincentivized for working hard because they know that their children are gonna get future subsidies. Uh, you would assume so, but again, it just generally seems that there are many, many assumptions in this mathematical model. And if someone was to rigorously have a crack at some of those assumptions, the model would fall apart pretty quickly. Uh, perhaps beyond the scope of the paper, my question would be from another angle, um, is any of this desirable? Um, is any of it politically uh, achievable? Uh, in political terms, um, there's a saying: when you've been when you've been privileged, sorry, that should be when you've been privileged for so long, equality feels like oppression. So even if you try and sell this to the rich people as we're going to grow the pie bigger for everyone, even more than traditional trickle down um, with this redistribution policy, um, so we're going to tax you a bit, but it's going to grow the pie bigger in the end for everybody, um, including your your pieces. Um, you still don't really know if, uh, for instance, the rich are going to have their relative social status affected. Will they use political power to resist? So is the model sort of practically workable in real life? Do the wealthy even want any any of their wealth to, to be trickled down? You, this model assumes an acceleration of trickle down or a more efficient way of trickle down is possible. But, uh, you know, maybe wealthy people don't even want any of their wealth to even trickle down. They want to keep every last little drop of it. Um, there are no real practical examples of redistribution policies hinted at, apart from some sort of proportional tax at the beginning of a wealth period. Um, so it perhaps needs to be linked just tentatively to some sort of practical or empirical real world example.